I'm very honored and pleased to welcome on uh, Freiheit Radio the the legal expert and uh, libertarian uh, Stefan Kinsella. Stefan, very, you're very welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Okay. Um, one of the first things I would like to ask you is that uh, could you please introduce yourself for those people? It may sound strange that still don't know you. Sure. Yes, I'm a uh, I'm an attorney in Houston, Texas, United States. Um, I'm a longtime libertarian writer and you know and uh, and advocate. And, you know, I've written a lot on the fields of intellectual property and libertarian rights theory, HAPA, Rothbard, and free markets, private property rights. Uh, but I'm also a practicing attorney here in Texas. And you've written a book, I believe? Yeah, I've written uh, several books, some on legal theory and some on legal topics, uh, which is my specialty, international law and intellectual property law, but also – in the in the sort of political theory world, I've written some other books and edited books, and one of them is against intellectual property. And uh, you can actually find the book online and more information about that at my website, which is stephankinsella.com. S T E P H A N Kinsella, which is an Irish originated name, which uh, means dirty head, actually, which <laughs> I don't have at present. <laughs> well, okay. we will add your. Uh Website address on the Facebook page uh, and in the broadcast uh, information. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And I would uh, like to recommend uh, this website to any libertarian who is seriously in trying to ground uh, why property rights are valid and, and things like that. Uh, uh, I would like to start uh, first with uh, you asked to ask you, could you explain the so-called Lockean Provisio? What is it and what are the, the historical roots of that term? Yeah, so the, the, the Lockean idea – I mean, of course, John Locke was a theorist in the 1600s, um, and he is one of the primal, primary founders of thought that a lot of pro-property rights, pro-freedom, pro-liberal, pro-Western people nowadays uh, draw back on even if they don't realize it. And John Locke basically had a simple idea, which a lot of people now think is, is obvious. Uh, but primarily that, that's because of his influence, and his idea was that if you were the first person to use something in the world, some scarce resource, um, then you have a better claim to it than other people. You know, you mix your labor with it. Now, he was arguing against sort of an earlier tradition, which was which which was more monarchistic, more feudalistic in some ways. So one thing he said was that. You have the right to your body and your person, and therefore you have the right to what you do with it, which he called labor, and therefore you own your labor, and therefore you own what you mix your labor with. But what he said was there's one exception to this, and that is that if you take something from the unowned state of nature, like a piece of land or whatever… That you have the right to it unless you don't leave enough for other people to homestead as well. So that was the Lockean proviso or proviso. So he said that you can take something that's unowned unless there's not much of it left. If there's not much of it left, then you do harm people by taking a piece of it. If there's tons of it around or lots of it around, then you don't harm other people by taking it. Now, I actually disagree with Locke on his proviso. But that was the proviso. He, he had one exception in his theory. So he said basically there's unowned things lying around. No one can complain if you are the first person to take it, and now you're the owner of that thing. But if there's only a little bit of it left, you could see why people would start complaining that you're the, you're, you know, you're the guy taking it. Yeah. So that was his proviso. Mm -hmm. and so in, as far as I can see, this clashes f for one instance… That with, with the idea that as libertarians, we would like to see a, a, a state where everything is privatized. Like, like Walter Block says, if it moves, privatize it, and if it doesn't move, privatize it also. Well, I, I do agree with that, but I think a different way to look at it is this, is that everything in the world that is potentially something that you could have a clash over or a conflict over, um, we – 
every legal system is going to have some rule that says who owns it, yep. right? Because otherwise you're just going to have struggle over it and there's no law. So the question is who should own it? So the question is what should the legal system say who should be the owner of a given resource? Okay. So the question is really not who should be the private owner or not. The question is who should be the owner. Now, when you say privatized, you're sort of implying that there should be no government. But I think the answer is simply who should be the owner of a given resource, and the answer is found in Locke. That is, the first person who finds it has a better claim than other people who come later. Or if you contractually transfer it to someone, you sell it or you donate it or you give it or you leave it by will, you know, by, by, in, by, by a testament to someone else, then they are the owner now of this thing. So by these very simple rules, you know, uh, contract and first ownership, you could always identify the proper owner of a given resource. So yep. the question is not private versus public. It's who is the proper owner of a given resource. Exactly. Yeah, of course. So when we look uh, a little bit deeper into his appropriation uh, theory in, of the Lockean uh, Provisio, we see that he, he uses uh, mixing your labor. And and as far as I uh, have understood your uh, your writings, you seem to have a problem with his labor theory. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, I, I think he was actually correct in his conclusion, um, but I think his argument contained an unnecessary step. What Locke said was that we all agree that we own ourselves. Now, the word self is sort of um, vague and ambiguous. Yes. To my mind, if you want to make it clear, you mean your body, because your body is the only thing someone can really take from you by force. I mean, they can't take my spirit. They can't take my memories. They can't take my soul. They can't take my feelings without really doing something to my body. So the, the, the thing we're really concerned about is the body. In fact, all the crimes that everyday humans would all agree are legitimate crimes and should be prohibited, like rape and theft and robbery and murder and kidnapping and slavery, they're all basically crimes – physical crimes against the borders of people's actual physical bodies. So that's the primary thing we need to be concerned about. Okay. So so Locke basically said, you know, you own yourself or your body, and therefore you own what you do with it, which is called labor. And if you own the labor, then you own what you mix it with. Um, I don't disagree with his conclusion, which was that if you if you mix your labor with an unowned resource, you know, like a piece of land or a tree, um, then you have a better claim than other people. I think he's correct about that. But his reasoning is that the reason you have a better claim is because you have an ownership claim to the labor. I just think this is a category mistake because labor is an action. It's what you do with your body. Exactly. So we own our bodies. That means we have the right to do with them what we want to do, but it doesn't mean that we metaphorically have the right to own the things, so, uh, so to speak, emanating from our bodies, which is labor. Um, it's okay to think of it in this way, but we have to be careful because metaphors can lead us astray. Yeah, and that would be my next question. What is exactly the danger of this view that you can own your labor? So the danger is, well, number one, it led to the view, which was adopted by others like Adam Smith and then Karl Marx, you know, the labor theory of value exactly. and property, yep. which led to communism and the devastation of hundreds, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of human lives. So it actually literally led to death and devastation for uncountable human beings in history in the 20th century. Uh, because of the mistaken view of the labor theory of value, which, by the way, is not the same thing, but it's related. So the labor theory of value says that l the value of an object is some kind of intrinsic, inherent quality of the thing. And where does it come from? It comes from the amount of labor you put into it. Now, if you have this view of value, which is incorrect according to the Austrian school, Mises and Hayek and Karl Menger… If you have this view of labor, then you have to believe that when you have an employee – I'm sorry, an employer who employs people like a capitalist, then if they make a profit, the
the profit almost necessarily comes from the surplus value of labor that the worker put into the project that he's not being compensated for. So you have to view basically voluntary free market interactions as a type of theft, and then you have to condemn them. And then you have to – the only way to fight that would be to have a type of statism right? that comes in and commands and controls the economy and prevents voluntary human relations. Or as Robert Nozick, a famous uh, American uh, libertarian theorist, said, um, you know, consensual acts among – or capitalist acts among consenting adults. Exactly. And once you prohibit that, then you open the door for fascism and totalitarianism. So that's one danger of the liberty theory of value. The yeah, other- it, led, it led to the exploitation theory of Marx, which justifies all kinds of interventions into the economy and personal lives of people. Exactly. And in political philosophy, I believe the, the main problem of Locke's uh, misstep, which, by the way, David Hume saw through. David Hume saw that this was, this was an unnecessary and fallacious step in Locke's theory. Locke's theory is correct, but without that step. Mm-hmm. And that step potentially leads to the idea that if you own your labor, then you own whatever proceeds from it. Well, then there's no restriction on this. This could be applied to things that are intangible as well as tangible. Exactly. So if your labor leads to something that's valuable, like a song or an opera or a painting or a movie – Something that's intangible, well, it has value. Your labor created it, and if you own the result of your labor, you should own this too. So the problem is that the this mistaken step in the Lockean argument, which was a heroic effort to you know, improve the situation that had gone before him, but it leads to the idea of intellectual property, primarily patent and copyright. The idea that we have the property right in our reputations… In songs and artistic works and in inventions because you created it with your labor and you own the proceeds of that. So it it sort of leads to a way that people can argue to validate the modern concept of patent and copyright and and other forms of intellectual property. Yep, exactly. I I find it very ironic that uh, uh, objectivists who are very anti-Marxist… Use this, uh, use that mistake, the labor theory of value, to justify their defense of uh, of IP. It, it is ironic. Um, yeah, you're right, especially because Rand was such a, a huge opponent of Marx, of course. Yes. Um, but Rand bought into the same mistaken idea that Locke did, that which Marx and Adam Smith and others bought into as well, which is this this labor conception. And remember, I, I don't want to criticize these guys. For where they were at the time, I mean, John Locke was an amazing. Well, he was a racist from from what <laughs> recent yeah. scholarship shows. Yeah. But if, if you look at his ideas, his ideas were a huge advance in in the liberal um, tradition. In their historical context, they're they're uh, these absolutely. Are, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm not criticizing him, but that doesn't mean his ideas were 100 percent correct. Exactly. Um, and I think what happened was, you know, so John Locke inspired the sort of liberal rationalist uh, revolution, which inspired the American Revolution, which gave rise to basically the, the libertarian tradition in the world today. Yep. And yes. and th- this is one reason why we can trace a lot of these ideas back to the founders and the you know America, even though they were also hypocritical. White racist proprietarian, you know, politicians <laughs> to a large extent, right? Right. Um, but but the ideas that, that 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 intertwined in between all of their writings and, and what was going on then can be traced back to Locke and and other English and continental writers. Exactly. You can um, see that you can see that in the in the Martin Luther King's uh, speech, uh, "I Have a Dream," where he cites the Declaration of Independence. Absolutely. And he and, so then, had, and he then yeah. unival, univalizes it. Yeah, yeah. It's not perfectly consistent. So so you have Ayn Rand escaping from Marxist dominated Russia coming to the US and she sees how great the US is compared to what she escaped from and she sees our constitution and our founding documents and she thinks this is great compared to what she's used to and she's right. She is. So she assumed, I think initially, that the Constitution and the United States founding period was this kind of amazing breakthrough in human civilization and history 
sort of the culmination of the of the Greek and the Western ideals, and that we had finally gotten it almost almost right, and she could fix it, but it was almost right. Which is which, by the way. So in the in the United States Constitution, um, you know, it's very non-libertarian or very not not perfect libertarian. It authorizes slavery. It permits taxation. It permits conscription. It permits war. It permits um, uh, lots of things that we would not agree with. And in the Fifth Amendment, it seems to authorize uh, eminent domain, which is the government taking private property yep. if you pay a price. And I mean, I've heard. Uh, I don't know if this is published yet, but uh, there are, there are letters from Rothbard and others. Showing that when Ayn Rand came to the country early on, she initially was actually in favor of eminent domain. She was. Because she was. The, and after yeah. talks with Isabel Patterson and others, she rejected the view. But in beginning, yeah, she, she changed. Was. She changed to her, to her credit. She changed yeah. her mind. But but the point is that you can see that she was heavily influenced by this idea that we have an experiment that almost worked. The the early American experiment. Yep. And she probably brushed aside, like a lot of us do, you know, the fact that we had slavery and that we were – women weren't treated properly and that we were more primitive, etc. But she had a, an ideal in mind, and she tried to build on that and improve on it, which is admirable, I think. But in the field of intellectual property, I think this is her fatal mistake, and also the field of government. I think Ayn Rand's two key mistakes were her foundation of rights, which was too intertwined with the idea of – Intellectual property under the influence of Locke. I agree. And also the idea that anarchists uh, are, are unlibertarian or are not consistent with her philosophy because I don't know, she thinks they're for chaos or that it can't work, or it's really not clear exactly what her criticism is. So. Yeah, I, I, I studied a lot of uh, libertarians. I've read several biographies of Rand, of Mises, of Hayek, of uh, Rothbard, and People are always disappointed in their heroes, but there is no perfect libertarian. People are partly the product of their time, and they they are subject to the limits of the time in which they have grown up. This goes for Mises as well as Rand. Mises uh, used to be for conscription and, and other things. And when he came to the to New York in in the, in the early 40s, he was the most moderate libertarian uh, within the libertarian circles. To to his surprise, to his utter surprise. So and people are constricted by the view in which they grow up, and therefore breakthroughs like like you've made them in in IP and patents are very very valuable. Well. Uh, right, and I don't mean to be critical of Ryan Rand. She was a she's a towering figure, uh, and so was Mises, of course. Yes. Um, what what happens on occasion? I mean, in in my case, I was really a dedicated adherent of Austrianism and freedom and liberty, but I was also a lawyer, and I was starting to become a patent attorney, an IP attorney, intellectual property attorney. So my attention turned more and more to this topic because. I was thinking, is this stuff that I'm practicing in my practice really justified? And Ayn Rand's justification in her – I think it's in um, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. I can't remember. She has an essay about yeah, the a very yeah, short essay. True. But it, it had always bugged me. I think it bugs a lot of people because it's not complete. She didn't pretend it was complete, but – she, you know, Ayn Rand is a very principled thinker. For example, in the antitrust case, you know, for what you call in Europe competition law, yeah, laws that prohibit monopolies or private companies from becoming too big or, or conspiring together to set prices, etc. Yeah, the Sherman. Act. Um, yeah, the Sherman Antitrust Act and 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 the Clayton Act over here, and I, I don't know what the names are in Europe, but there are similar laws around the world. Um, Ayn Rand heroically and her her. Her main followers that she allowed to be printed in her books, she opposed antitrust law not on empirical grounds like Milton Friedman would, but on principled grounds. Like you have the right, you know, two businessmen have the right to meet together and set prices if they want to. Yep. And honestly, what's the difference between two independent companies or two companies that get bought by a bigger company and, and they, they're they're banded together under the same corporate structure, which is permissible legally. I mean, it makes no difference. You know, it makes no sense to distinguish between them. But the point is, her defense of antitrust was primarily moral 
that you have the right to try to set prices. And then she would say, well, you know, empirically, we don't think this is going to work. Cartels won't work, and there's economic forces that will limit the bad effects of this, etc. Um, in, in patent law, uncharacteristically, and copyright and patents, in trying to defend the existing law, she adopted utilitarian ad hoc arguments. Exactly. So she, she was stuck trying to defend a 17-year patent term and a 50-year after the life of the author copyright term. Now, these are totally arbitrary, as is obvious to anyone. Yeah. And there's, there's no way you can defend that on, on natural rights type grounds. So Ayn Rand was stuck trying to come up with a way to defend this American type system of IP law because it was part of the founding. And it, it sort of it, 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 it complemented her ideas of the importance of the intellect and the mind. And I think that's one thing we have to fight. We have to make clear that just because we're opposed to state granted intellectual property law does not mean that we're not capitalist. Doesn't mean we're not pro property rights. It doesn't mean we're against creativity and the intellect. I think it's the, actually the opposite way around. We have to at least make it clear, even if you disagree with us, that the reason we oppose these state grants of monopoly privilege is because we are in favor of creativity. We're in favor of freedom. Exactly. We're in favor of a vigorous free market. We're in favor of individual property rights. You might disagree with us that that's the implication, but that's our basis. It's not because of communism or collectivism or hatred of profit or this kind of stuff. There's nothing to do with it. Let me ask you, uh, for, for our listeners who are not up to, uh, up to date uh, about IPs and patents, could you very basically explain the difference between intellectual property and patents? Yeah, well, intellectual property is a term that's used, and in Europe it's called industrial property. Um, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. So it's sort of a term that refers to several types of, of legal – of laws or legal regimes that are related to each other. Uh, patent is one. Copyright is another. Trademark is another. And there are a few others, but um, I won't bore you with details. What they have in common, according to the people that try to group them together, is that they all relate to products of the intellect or products of the mind that are intangible. And that have some value in commerce. Okay, so a trademark is you know the name of your company or your product, like Coca Cola or Mercedes or Boeing, whatever. And a um, a, a a copyright is a legal right to the way you express something that's creative and original, like a painting or a novel or a movie or even software in some cases. Or a book, um, and and patent has to do with a, a, an innovative and practically useful idea, like uh, the way you design a machine, or the way you have a chemical or or some kind of technical process that re produces something useful. So you basically have these three fundamental types of intellectual property, which which are called. So a patent would be a subset. Of the field of intellectual or industrial property. Okay, okay. And could you explain the utilitarian defense of intellectual property, and also tell us what's wrong with it? Well, so if you ask someone, why do we have this? So there's there's you know two different ways of looking at it. Why why in terms of historical origin, why did they ar arise? Why why do we have these laws? And the other question is, why do we need them? Which is the defense of these laws. And historically, the origin is that you know the governments, the monarchies in the in Europe in the 1500s, 1700s were granting these monopolies. The king would you know grant a monopoly to a court favorite or some guy in a town that was a popular guy or someone who was powerful. He would say, "You you can you're the only guy who can sell soap or can sell you know sheepskin or whatever." They just gave him a monopoly. It's called a patent. So the practice of patents arose in the in the in the form of just protectionism or mercantilism, and copyrights arose when the printing press started threatening them, you know, the, the monopoly on ideas that the church and the, and the state held, sort of in combination. So they would have these guilds that would authorize which books could be printed, et cetera, and then finally this resulted in legislation which 
which devolved to the authors, but then went was transferred right back to the publishers because of the practicalities of the industry. And so in other words, the authors got the copyright, but then the publishing houses got the monopoly right back again because – to have a book published, you had to go back to the publishers. So that's the practical origin of the things. The argument nowadays for it, and if we take as a classic case the United States Constitution, which was ratified in 1789, about 200 and, I don't know, 20 something years ago, um, the, um, the clause in the Constitution says that to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, Okay, which Congress shall have the power to grant to authors and inventors for limited times the, the, the restricted or the privileged use to their their creative writings or works. So the theory there, and then right after that, the Copyright Act and the and the Patent Act were enacted, and and ever since then, the Western world has modeled what the U.S. did more or less. So they're pretty much all the same. So the idea is that. If you don't have a patent law, which gives you a monopoly on your invention, then you would keep secret for as long as you could your idea. You would keep it as what's called a trade secret, which is a fourth type of intellectual property. Mm-hmm. Okay? And the people that are behind this say that that's a bad thing, that we want information to spread. So what we will say is we'll say, listen, if you disclose to the public exactly how you made your invention – then we're going to give you a 17-year monopoly on it. So you can make profits for 17 years, monopoly profits, but in, in exchange, you have to disclose to the world how you did it. So that's the primary idea behind patents, although most people would argue that it's something else, is to incentivize invention in the first place. But that's yeah. not what's in patent laws. They actually require you to disclose what you're doing in exchange for getting a monopoly. So that's the literal bargain. And in copyright, it's similar, but the idea is that to incentivize people to create artistic works like songs or paintings or novels, we have to let them be the only one who can sell their work for some limited time, which nowadays is the life of the author plus 70 years. So it's over 100 years in most cases, literally over a century. And it used to be, by the way, 14 – for both of these, it used to be 14 years, sometimes extendable for another uh, 7 or 14 years. And the 14-year term came about totally by happenstance because the idea was that if, you, if, you ha- if you're like a, a guy who gets a monopoly from the king and you have an apprentice, then apprentice terms last for seven years. Right, so you need to have you need to have time to train two apprentices to do what you're doing, and to keep them from competing with you. So two apprentice terms is 14 years. So this is how these terms came about. It was just totally protectionism, totally utilitarian, um, totally unprincipled. And as of today, with our modern empirical econometric techniques, totally unsubstantiated by any data whatsoever. The data we have nowadays, all the economic studies we have, uh, indicate that there is no – there is no way whatsoever to substantiate the claim that we need these laws to have innovation, creativity, artistic works, invention. In fact, the evidence indicates that we would have at least as much, if not more, without these laws. Yeah, I, I would say that as well. When you look at, for instance, the music industry, you see that, that bands get paid very, very little per album and that they make 80% of the money they make through touring and merchandise. Yes, and whenever you bring up an example like that, the proponent of IP will just switch to another industry. Yes, they will. So they'll say, <laughs> well, what, a, what about perfume? What you know? What or, or what about what if I want to publish a book that's a nonprofit bo- or, or or a nonfiction book? Am I supposed to go read my book to audience? I mean, so everything you mention, you you come up, you overcome one of their ad hoc examples, and yeah. they will come up with another one um, just to try to show that you you can't solve their utopian dreams of a world where everyone gets paid to do whatever they think should be done or what the government thinks should be done. 
Yes, and and that's always the same because when you as a libertarian try, try to defend the, the 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 free market, they will say, "How about roads? You explain the roads. How about hospitals? You explain the hospitals. How about this? How about that?" And you'll be talking for hours, and they're still not convinced. It's, and that is because I think that they don't accept or get the moral defense because the moral defense makes uh, uh, acts like a limit, and within that limit of that moral defense, then you can go search for practical solutions. But first you have to accept moral limits. This is not allowed. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But I also think that if they were at least sincere, I mean, if you're just an empirical-minded person and you want results, and you're just, you know, if you really were sincere about the roads question and you got a good answer, you know, a sincere person would stop and think, hmm, okay, he actually gave me a good answer. Maybe I'm going to stop and think about what led me to ask that question in the first place. But instead, they just turn to the next question. They have like a list of 115 yeah. questions they're, they're <laughs> going to ask. I know. You yeah. know. And if you answer all 100, 115 questions, they have another – they can they can go to their friends and get the next set of questions. That They will never stop. Um, so I agree with you. But I, I do think even if you were an empirical-minded person – I mean look, if you were an honest, empirical-minded person with – with totally no principles, but just an ad hoc sort of idea that I'll go where the evidence leads me. Well, the evidence in the in the field of patent and copyright shows that countries that have had no IP have had artistic creation and they've had innovation. Okay, and we know that it's possible, and there's yep. no evidence to support it, and we know that it leads to this huge industry that we have now of patent trolls. Copyright trolls, censorship, $100 million and billion-dollar verdicts against companies, the repression of competition, um, the creation of oligopolies because you have these companies like Apple and Samsung and Microsoft and yep. Google that basically they rise to the fore and they can afford to fight each other. And they waste and they, billions of dollars uh, to fight each they other. They waste it and they pass the costs on to us. Exactly. Right? And and they don't have they have less money to reduce to, to use for innovation. But the smaller companies, the innovators, the upstarts, they're on the outside of this wall. They can't compete with these guys because they don't have enough money to withstand a lawsuit. So it really does lead to repressed competition, re reduced um, free markets, and reduced consumer welfare. So all the things that the patent advocates pretend to be in favor of, any sober, realistic analysis of the situation would lead you to say, maybe in a free, in, maybe in a perfect world that God designs, I would be in favor of an idealistic, utopiaized sort of patent system. But we don't have anything near that. There's no chance of having that. We would clearly be better off by having no patent system than any patent system we can expect to have in the real world. That is what a practical, pragmatic person would conclude if they were honest and serious. Um, so even if you don't have morals and principles, if you're just really honest <laughs> and sincere, then you would have to oppose the IP system. That's a very good explanation. Uh, could you, could you uh, explain a little the, the difference between intangible property and real property and how – when intentional property is uh, protected by laws, uh, is a danger for real property rights. Yeah, and so the word intangible. I mean, I mean, I'm, I know I'm speaking across languages here, but tangible means touchable, something you can touch with your hands, right? And some people like um, um, uh, Hardy Bouillon, who's a French uh, writer who's written some of, of my publications. He's argued that. That's a better word would be material versus immaterial, and I don't strongly disagree with him on that. You're correct, um, but which goes back to the idea of scarcity and non-scarcity, um, which really, honestly, if you want to talk about the most coherent way to describe this and to explain it, is uh, rivalry versus non-rivalry. It's an economic concept. What it means is if there's a resource out there in the world, something that we need to use. To accomplish our ends in life, you know, like bread or fruit or a chair or a bat or a car or a house or an apple or whatever or land. If there's some resource, then the reason it's a resource, the reason it's used as a to achieve an end, and the reason we need property rights in it is because only one person can use this thing. 
right? So if I have an egg, you can't take my egg and make your fried egg with it and let me make mine too. Only one of us can. So this egg only has a limited use. And so if it's going to be used productively and peacefully by people that cooperate with each other and have a society among each other, we have to have some kind of socially recognized rule that says whenever you have a resource that people can conflict over or clash over, we just have to have a rule that says who gets to use it so that we can know who uses it, where the borders are, and we can live in peace with each other. And then if I don't have the right to use that thing, then I can trade with the guy that has the right to use that thing. That's the peaceful, cooperative way to do things. This is why property rights have emerged. This is why property rights uh, are, are necessary and are an essential aspect of human civilization. So all property rights have to do with things that are rivalrous or scarce resources, right? Um, so the, then the only question is who should get to use it? And this is why we get back to what we talked about in the beginning about Locke, Locke's idea that well, the person who first started using it has a better claim to this thing than someone who comes later unless he gives it voluntarily to someone else, and then they have a better claim even against the first guy. So with these very simple rules, with the idea that we recognize that when there's a scarce resource, we need a rule that says who owns the thing, okay? And then the rule is whoever first owns it or who has an earlier claim to it or who has a better contractual claim to it. That's basically it. One exception would be in the case of crimes or torts. So if you do something wrong to someone, so let's say you know, you trespass against me or my property, then you might be said to incur some kind of obligation to repay me, to make restitution towards me. And in that case, some of your property now is transferred to the person that you harmed. But other than that case, so, so in other words, we could say there's a third rule. We can always identify the owner of a resource by asking a combination of questions. Who first owned it or who had the earlier claim to it? Who first used it, that is? Who made a contractual voluntary transfer of it? Or who committed some kind of act of trespass or crime which also – effectively transferred it to the victim of that crime. But other than that, you don't really need anything else to determine who owns a given resource. Now, you asked about the danger of trying to assign rights in intangible things. So the question the, the point is if you assign rights in the way I described, that basically exhausts the possibility. It it answers all the questions of who can own a given resource. If you come up with another rule, it has to undercut one of the earlier rules. So if you say that, yeah, the guy that owns this car is the guy that created it or bought it from a previous owner, right? Unless some other guy uh, came up with a way to tune his engine that this other guy is using too closely. So what you're doing is you're coming up with a third homesteading rule or you're coming up with another property transfer rule that basically takes the property from the owner to some third party. This is the fundamental problem. You cannot give rights and intangible things without taking things that already owned other people. So if you grant someone a copyright or a patent, you're giving them the right to go to a court to use force to tell them you cannot use your property in this way unless you pay me rent or unless you get my permission. And – the problem with that is that that assumes that the guy demanding payment is the owner of the thing, but he's not. <laughs> he's demanding payment from the owners. So the fundamental problem with granting rights in intangibles is the same thing as the problem with granting positive welfare rights. Exactly. I was thinking about that. Yes. Yeah, it's the same thing. Because it's the same thing because it corrupts the, the real existing rights, the, the negative rights in this case. Yeah, it dilutes – well, nothing comes for free, right? So you, you, if the government prints more money, they're not creating wealth. They're just diluting the purchasing power of the existing money held by the people. And when the government creates positive rights, every right comes with an obligation. So if you have the right to attend university for free, 
What that means is that your neighbors have the obligation to pay for it. Yep. So every right comes with a price, and it, whenever you have the positive right or whenever you come up with an IP right, it always has to necessarily take away from existing established rights in scarce resources. That's very clear. Uh, IP and uh, uh, patents is not the only thing you have been writing about. One thing you have been writing about are Hans Hermann Hoppen argumentations ethics. Could you explain those a little bit? Yes. So Hans Hermann Hoppe is a, uh, a German um, legal uh, political theorist and an Austrian economist. When I say Austrian, I mean he is influenced heavily by um, the Austrian school of economics, which is primarily Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, an American who was Mises' student. So Hoppe is a, um, is a, is a, is a philosopher and Austrian political and economic theorist. And among Hoppe's many contributions to all these fields is his uh, idea, which he introduced in the late 80s, after he moved to the United States and started studying under Rothbard and became Rothbard's um, uh, chief uh, sort of um, student and uh, protege. That was in Las Vegas, wasn't it enough? I think that was uh, – I think initially it was not. I think, oh. I think Rothbard was in New York at first, and then they both moved – Soon after to to Las Vegas for for about a decade. Okay, uh, but I think initially Rothbard was in, in in New York. I could be wrong about that. But in any case, um, Hoppe was a more Kantian and uh, type of uh, uh, philosopher. And from what I've learned, Hoppe basically came up with praxeology, which is Mises's sort of unique twist. And the most rigorous interpretation of Austrian economics uh, out there. He came up with a version of praxeology on his own. He was raised as a leftist in Germany. He was a brilliant philosopher, you know, grad student type, and he started coming up with these theories on his own. And and then he stumbled across Rothbard and Mises, and he realized that Mises had basically done this already. If okay, I may, so, if I may interrupt you first, uh, praxeology yeah. is is the the Austrian term for the study of human action, right? Praxeology is Mises's term for. Yes. Um, I think he came up with it. That's his version of Austrian economics. Austrian economics was a, is, a, is a field of economics that I think was originated by Karl Menger in the late 1800s, and it started in his idea of, of marginalism and subjectivism um, but then uh, others you know developed it and Mises in most in a lot of people's view is the most rigorous and most individualist and the most um, scientific in a sense and he systematized it and he called his method of analysis praxeology he came up with the word I believe on his own based upon Greek roots or Latin roots yep he did and it means the logic of the logic of action. Or yep. the, you know the science or the study or the logic of human action. Yep. So what he it was a kind of a Kantian style, anal style analysis where he said we can take as a given, as an undeniable given, certain things about human nature and the facts of the world, which is that humans act, and that has certain implications. Human human beings are actors. We're not physical particles that are bouncing around like bowling balls or billiards balls. We actually have purposes. We have teleology, right, in the Aristotelian sense. But because we have an action, what that means is as an actor, you view the world at a present moment, and you see – you envision what you think is going to come in the future, and you are unsatisfied with the direction of what you think is coming. And so you use your understanding of the world now – to say, what do I have it available at my disposal that I can use to change the course of action, to change the course of the future, to change the course of history, basically, or the future history? And so you basically utilize some scarce means or some scarce resource to try to interrupt the flow of affairs to, to achieve some future state of affairs that you predict will happen if you are successful that will make you happier. So that's what human action is in general, and there's lots of economic implications you get from that. Now, Hoppe um, started deriving these ideas on his own, but then when he discovered Mises and Rothbard, he became quickly an adherent of 
of Mises and Rothbard and an anarcho-capitalist in the radical American sense and quickly dropped his early flirtation with European leftism, etc., although he retained some of his atta- att- attraction to the Kantian framework. Okay, And he came up with an idea because one of his professors, when he was getting his habilitation – or his PhD was a Jürgen Habermas, who was a famous, you know, European lefty intellectual yep. German. Yep. And Habermas has this idea called communication ethics or discourse ethics. Now Habermas and his associate uh, Karl Otto Appel, another German, uh, who Hoppe actually prefers in terms of the rigor of his thought, they both thought that the there's something about the nature of justification when we have a discussion between two people like you and I are doing now. There's something about that that has implications for what you could justify. So you couldn't – to take a crazy example, you and I – it would be it, it, hard to imagine a, a sincere discussion between you and me about which one of us gets to own the other because we might as well just try to shoot each other or kill each other. I mean if we're, if we're actually having a real discussion, we're sort of taking some things for granted, which is I have the right to my body. You have the right to your body. Let's go from there, and let's see what we can figure out. Something like that in a non-rigorous sense. Now, Habermas and Appel thought that this had implications for social democracy and democracy in general, and they thought that it meant that you had to have the right to you know, uh, basic housing and a living and a job and all these social de- democratic things. Now, Hoppe, when he got influenced by Rothbard Mises, thought not so fast. I think your basic insight is sound and potentially profitable, but I think if you have the insights of Rothbardian political radicalism and Misesian social theory, then you have to realize that the implications of your communications ideas, your discourse ethics, is that the only political theory you could ever justify would be a totally other respecting type of ethic. That is the peace ethic. That is the Lockean libertarian ethic. So that's Hoppe's argument. In a, uh, that's not really the argument. That's how it came about. Mm-hmm. The nutshell is that he believes that the, the essence of discourse is peace and cooperation. And so that basically means that you could never make a coherent, peaceful, cooperative argument in an actual discourse to argue for something – Seriously, contrary to that, like slavery or you know some kind of a class system or a domination system where one class rules the other so would, would you yeah. would you say would you say that that it works like an axiom well, it depends on what you mean by axiom I mean you know in math, axiom just means an assumed postulate in the Randian sort of Aristotelian sense an axiom. I was talking about the new, uh, new uh, Aristotelian uh, framework that in an axiom you can't deny the axiom without contradicting yourself. I think I think it does with one with one difference. So the axiom in the Randian, neo-Randian, Aristotelian sense is is basically some kind of uh, statement that is self-contradictory to deny, right? Like the law of non-contradiction yep. or the law of identity. Or the law of causality, or even some factual statements like the fact that there is consciousness. Like you couldn't deny that you're conscious or that you exist as an actual existing observer without contradicting yourself. So some of those get very close to what Hoppe and, and the realistic form of Kantianism that he is an inherent of. He, and, and according to Hoppe, and I, I've, I've come to agree with him, there are two main strands of Kantianism. One is the American interpretation, which is more idealistic and idealistic not in the sense of having ideals, but in the sense of believing that the, the world of ideas is paramount and mm-hmm. that we don't have a direct connection to reality. It's more of a sub- subjectivist or relativist interpretation. And the European interpretation of Kant, which is apparently more realistic, and uh, according to Hans Hoppe, it, he doesn't care which one is correct. I mean, if Hans, if, if if Kant really meant A or B, it doesn't matter. But the the one that makes sense is the realistic interpretation, which is the Misesian and the, yeah. and the Hoppian, and even the Randian version, which Rand would would deny. But the point is, according to the realistic interpretation or use of the Kantian type of mental framework that that Hoppe and and Mises use. 
um, some of the arguments do are very similar to the way Rand herself would would demonstrate her axiomatic concepts. So she would she would demonstrate identity, the law of identity, the law of non contradiction, and the law of causation, and other fundamental laws by showing that denying them is self contradictory. And some of the laws Hoppe talks about are similar, except they re, they they basically um, rely upon perform, what's called performative contradiction. So the contradiction is not like necessarily an inherent logical contradiction. Like you could imagine a universe with no humans. Yep. And in a universe with no humans, there would be no human action. But Mises is correct to say that it's undeniable that there is human action because. For anyone to deny it, they were acting as a human. Exactly. And they, they'd be counter contrad so that's a performative contradiction. I see. So yes, I would say I would say the Hoppian proof of rights is a cousin to at at least yes. of the Randian Aristotelian uh, axiomatic uh, logical proofs. Thank you. Uh, and, and one last question, I have because we're over an hour now, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. But you have uh, contributed to this uh, kind of thought as well, and you came up during class, I believe, with what you call the unstoppable principle, and you connected it to the uh, non-aggression principle. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, right. So this is the late 80s when I was in law school, and I was – Infatuated with Hoppe's insights uh, about argumentation ethics, and at the time I was learning in contract theory about the ancient principle called estoppel, which is not only a common law view. There's something similar in the civil law, the continental law, which you guys have. Mm -hmm. um, the basic idea is that there's something unjust about permitting someone to take two cons inconsistent stances – in a say a certain legal proceeding, so you can't you can't argue one thing to make gains in a certain part of the proceeding, and then later on say the exact opposite. If you did that, you'd be stopped or prevented from. You know, the judge would just say, "Listen, you you already admitted that you're married to this woman. Yeah. Now you can't say you're not married to her. You you got it. It's got to be one way or the other." So, in a logical sense, that's you can see the origins of that or the roots of that idea is that we have to. To have a coherent argument, to have a serious argument, to try to get to the truth of things, you have to at least be consistent, right? And something struck me about that idea in contract law, which was that there's 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 something ultra consistent about the libertarian insistence of the non-aggression principle, which is the idea that we libertarians believe that you have the right to do anything you want in the world. Except commit aggression. Now, what does that mean? That means that you can use force only in response to force. So you can see the sort the sort of symmetry there that force is 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 justified only when it's in response to an initiation of force. But force in response to aggression is justified because there's a symmetry there. So you can't use force. You may not use force unless it's in response to force. So if someone insults me, maybe I can insult them back, but I can't punch them in the nose because they didn't use force. But if they punch me in the nose, I can punch them back. So you see a symmetry there. So it made me think that you know, if you've committed – if you're the first one to commit the act of aggression, you, you've initiated force, the reason that it's okay for the other guy to punch you back is because you are stopped – from complaining because you're basically taking two inconsistent positions. You're saying when you punch someone in the nose, you're inf you, you're effectively saying it's legitimate for me to do this. And when you object to being punched in the nose in response, you're saying punching people is wrong. Well, you can't have it both ways. You have to choose, right? So that's the idea, and I think it's totally based upon and complementary to Hoppe's approach as well. It's just another way to look at the, the same idea. Yeah. It's another way to flesh out why the libertarian idea is natural and intuitive and fundamental and uh, really should be intuitive to everyone, not just libertarians, but everyone. Yeah, but what, what you and Hans Hermann Hoppe do is it, it, it's just nice to you know say, well, this is intuitive, 
But when you can make it explicit, then you can really defend it. Then it, then it becomes clear. Then I think so. When you try to add some rigorous uh, interpretation to it, I think – yeah, I think it has uh, – I've tried to do that. Hoppe has tried. Others have tried. And uh, you know, we, we do as good as we can uh, to try to explain to people what they really already know. Most people already know <laughs> is wrong to hurt people. They, they know this. This is why we have political dialogue because yeah. people are searching for justification for these kind of uncomfortable political things that they're wanting to favor. So we just have to get people to be consistent and be honest and look at the logic and the economics of what they're talking about. Well, that, uh, that sounds like a real great uh, closing note. Thank you very much for your time and, uh, and your wisdom during this interview. And uh, I'll hope we, we meet one day and, and talk again. Love to do it. Thank you very much. Okay.